So I posted a URL um, for the slides that I was intending to kind of publish. Um, and then I remembered that back in 2012, um, I discovered a bug in the wireless stack for FreeBSD. Um, and then it turns out that I'd completely forgotten about it and I'm still kind of bitten by it today. So I haven't actually, the URL is there, but um, I haven't managed to publish the slides yet. Um, so excuse me. Um, uh, I don't know if you saw, um, I think it was yesterday, there was a IoT company that was making a juicer uh, that announced that they were kind of closing up. Um, uh, there was a kind of a meme that started yesterday, but uh, maybe it's too obscure a reference. Um, so I'm not uh, really a, a hardware uh, person. I, I like playing with hardware, uh, but my background is um, open source software. Um, and I've worked with various um, open source uh, projects from uh, dealing with operating systems, uh, from the building the software or documenting it. Um, and I thought um, that it might be a good idea to run a workshop um, about this. Uh, this basically goes back, uh, I realized actually back to um, Oshcamp 2012. Um, uh, all the way up to um, earlier this year. Uh, so at OSHCAMP 2012, we actually had uh, a, uh, two talks, uh, one from um, Melanie, um, who was talking about dealing with um, ARM and uh, building systems using Linux. Um, I was kind of really outraged by the, you know, the complications of the process, and I spent most of the day sitting over there uh, trying to kind of cross-compile my own um, FreeBSD image for Raspberry Pi, um, which I managed to do by the end of the day. Um, and then the following day, Omer ran a workshop on um, dealing with GPIO um, and uh, how to get started. Um, I'd kind of completely long forgotten about this until uh, last night when I uh, looked at this, uh, the slides for the, sorry, not the slides, the website. And I realized that actually, uh, you know, this thing did happen uh, back then. Um, another, uh, another event which had a kind of an impact on me was a chip hack back in 2013, which was uh, just exposure to kind of closed uh, tool chains which are forced on you um, and how brittle um, they can be and how you can just lose so much time um, trying to fight uh, something that's put together uh, quite badly. Um, so back at uh, OSHAG uh, number 46, Andrew asked me to give a presentation about uh, the different operating systems uh, in the BSD family um, and how they would be a benefit uh, to someone. Um, and I kind of did this um, all-encompassing uh, talk about uh, three or four different operating systems. Um, and then Andrew asked me again uh, to perhaps run a workshop. Um, and for the workshop, um, I've never... Uh, done this before, and I thought it might be a bit much trying to cover three or four operating systems for a, um, a group of people, and just focused on one being uh, NetBSD. <clears throat> so um, the main reason that I thought it wasn't, I wasn't trying to kind of recruit new users, but just to kind of plant seeds about uh, what people could expect um, from an environment, because a lot of uh, a lot of projects are quite badly put together, and uh, especially in NetBSD, the tooling is uh, quite nice that it could save you a lot of time. Um, and because people are quite uh, passionate about the project, um, the focus on uh, technical correctness um, means that, they, that there's not that much, I mean, there's bad code, but there's not kind of uh, shortcuts everywhere. People pay attention to detail. Um, and that kind of feeds back in terms of respect for the user's time. Um, so I was hoping to kind of demonstrate that to, um, to people. Um, so um, so we, we, uh, in NetBSD, like, um, the ability to kind of cross-compile is uh, quite fundamental to the project. Um, so you have these things, not even for the operating system, but you know, like kind of bootloaders for Windows. You actually dynamically generate the Visual Studio configuration file using common Unix tools. Um, 
And I didn't realize actually how bad uh, things can be. Um, so in this case, like embedded Visual Studio, um, you have this kind of GUI interface for setting up your, uh, for your software, you know, where your dialog boxes are going to go. Even the slightest movement of one of these dialog boxes just renders your file completely corrupt, and you have to kind of go back and start again. Um, there's a gentleman uh, by the name of Brett Victor um, who does a t he gave a talk called Inventing on Principle, which was a few years old now. But he talks about if you can reduce the feedback time between uh, when you're experimenting with things, um, how that opens you up to kind of being able to explore new possibilities with these. So at the time, this wasn't public, but uh, it's a, he was demonstrating a feature that's in, um, in Xcode as standard now, which is dynamically, uh, as you're writing code, the compiler in the background is experimenting with uh, compiling your code. So your, your mistakes are pointed out um, as you're actually introducing them, rather than having this kind of long um, feedback time. Um, and uh, for another, uh, on the other extreme of it, uh, there's a talk from Usenix uh, by Brian Cantrell, which talks about um, before they had uh, D-Trace in Solaris, where Sun had a, a very expensive computer by the name of the E10,000. And the average boot time for this machine was about 45 minutes. And he was dealing with a customer uh, where they misconfigured a system to be a router, and they were doing uh, SAP benchmarks. And every so often, it would stop processing the SAP benchmarks and start processing packets, and then it would crash. And then that was like 45 minutes again. And so being able to kind of see that very quickly and um, uh, flag it up is really beneficial for the operator. Um, and so sometimes, you know, people don't find a solution and they kind of harbor, um, or they, they, they suffer these environments, you know, people who, you know, fear restarting Windows because, you know, it's, you're going to go through at least three reboot cycles um, and you're going to be down for about 40, uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, or you don't know what, what's going to be introduced when the system comes back up, whether your machine is going to be actually operating still in the same way. Um, and that kind of has other subtle um, issues as well, where you're kind of fearful of uh, being able to kind of test something out. Um, a common issue is like in the networking world where you're being sold an appliance and redundancy may not be an actual uh, functionality that's available out of the box. That's a licensed feature. So which means once that thing is kind of live, you're really fearful of um, making any changes. Uh, and that's really sad because, you know, just because you put something out there doesn't mean that you got it right the first time. And for you to be in fear of uh, making any further changes is, seems cruel. Um, so I started thinking about, uh, for the workshop, about um, what could I present? Uh, my assumption is that you're all interested in hardware. so. How could I present these, um, this software project that would be appealing for someone who actually doesn't care about the software and just needs something to run on their hardware? Um, and so this idea about saving time and um, the tooling that lets you kind of do things very quickly without um, having to do a whole bunch of reading up um, was on my mind. Um, So some of the things that I uh, decided to cover was um, the system is really well documented and the documentation is like freely available. Um, and that's actually a part of the development project, um, uh, sorry, the, the development process uh, for the project. Uh, so you're not actually going around on a wild rampage trying to, uh, trying to find a solution to the problem. It's uh, the implementation has the, uh, the documentation with it. Um, Cross-compilation, like I said, is, is there out of the box, and it's really easy, single command, and uh, you're building your tool chain, and you're building your operating system. Um, in most of these cases, uh, there's a lot of um, 
expectation for knowledge about uh, programming or um, system details. But in the case of NetBSD, there's a uh, the Lua language is embedded within the system, so you have this kind of very high-level um, interface um, to the operating system, so you can interact with it without having to know, say, C um, or C++. Um, and then in an embedded environment, you usually have a slow board um, or you don't have much memory and uh, you know, your development time is uh, quite slow. So you can move away from that and actually develop um, on a desktop where you can build uh, quickly and then make push your uh, changes to production afterwards with a uh, rump. Um, and obviously security is a hot issue, so uh, a bit of tamper resistance with um, a, a subsystem that's built in. So if there's any problems with a binary, uh, it, the system won't execute it for you. Um, which means that if you're writing badly written code, which uh, the system gets compromised, uh, you only get one shot at it. You know, once the binary changes, the system won't run it for you. Um. <clears throat> so in theory, yes, all of this stuff kind of is there out of the box. But the reality of it is, is when you actually sit down with a group of people and try to work through the steps, you actually realize the problems that are actually there that you kind of assumed uh, it was all perfect, right, <laughs> on the previous slide. Um, so in our case, uh, lots, of lo lots of the software re relies on autoconf. Um, in this case, if you take a modern operating system like Windows 10, um, autoconf, main, uh, some of the stuff doesn't know about Windows 10 or even that there's a 64-bit version of Windows. Um, so that kind of blows up. Um, turned out that the images that we have for like the things like the beagle bone um, weren't actually bootable um, because uh, we weren't marking partitions as, um, as bootable and it wasn't working. Uh, various drivers weren't actually working either. Um, and there was actually differences in configuration. So what of when, when with someone with a Raspberry Pi, they would have one result, but someone with a beagle bone would have a completely different result. Um, and for U-Boot, you can have different um, startup scripts, and they actually work in order. Um, and the firmware will try different uh, uh, boot scripts. And depending on uh, which board you have, you have different scripts. and it, you, you kind of trip yourself up quite quickly um, because there's a mishmash of uh, not everything is in a single place. Uh, so those things were kind of fixed, um, apart from the U-boot script, which I'll come up to. Uh, the stuff that we managed to introduce into the operating system, we managed to add more bits to Lua, so uh, you can do a lot more uh, without actually um, having to know anything about the system details. So things like um, adding users um, and things like that. Um, and moving out from the operating system, we now actually also package up um, U-Boot as well. So you can take uh, Windows or your Mac OS and within a couple of commands have uh, generated firmware images um, for your board, be it a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone or things like that. Um, still to do, um, improve the documentation. Um, I think uh, trying to actually remove um, any uh, any uh, background uh, context um, and reduce it down so it's. Uh, it's much more easier uh, to get started. Uh, the, some of the examples that I actually used uh, were a bit too kind of system oriented uh, and that also could be improved. Um, we're planning to extend uh, the Lua subsystem even more so there's, you can do even more without actually having to write a single line of C um, or, or know anything about the system internals again. Um, one of the problems that we have is, um, like with uh, 
Debian, you have a hard-coded user by default. And that uh, creates a security problem because most people end up just pushing these um, images into public-facing um, devices um, and uh, get caught out. So we were thinking of actually creating a mechanism where you would just create a file and put the user details in that. And when the system boots up, it would create that user for you. Um, but haven't actually worked out a way of doing that cleanly, whether that's a one-time thing or if it's, um, uh, if it's always going to be active. So every time it boots up, it will always perform this task. <clears throat> and also the organization of uh, the, uh, the U-boot scripts. Uh, it seems that though you have this kind of generic firmware environment, uh, the scripting uh, for it is... Uh, is a bit of a mess because, like I said, the file can be named in different ways, and depending on which file it is, uh, it will get uh, picked first, or it would be picked in different order. Uh, uh, and that's all I have. Um, I so. Uh, I ran this uh, workshop at uh, OSHAG and then um, also at uh, B-Sides in London um, and also in uh, Cambridge as well. And uh, the responses uh, were different. I think like for the tamper resistant stuff for the security audience, it was kind of, uh, you didn't really have to kind of give much technical background. It kind of just triggered the light bulb of, you can do this thing out of the box um, and you don't need, um, to create a whole bunch of tooling for it. Um, for the stuff in Cambridge, we actually realized that uh, there's still a whole bunch of things that you actually need to um, explain, which is why I was saying about uh, simplifying the documentation. Um, removing all that uh, introductory kind of steps of this is how you get started. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. <clears throat> <clears throat>